in my last video with the Supra, we installed the intercooler kit from CX Racing. And in that video, I kind of ran out of time with doing any kind of explanation as far as, well, the pros and cons of the intercooler, particularly on this car. However, in reality, it could go for any vehicle, including the Z32. So in this video, I'm gonna go over the pros and cons of having the intercooler installed on a car, which for the most part should be common knowledge. It obviously cools the temps, but there's so much more to it than that. We're gonna go over the finer details in this video. And I'm gonna be explaining to you how an intercooler will affect the turbo spool up and how the turbo size is then affected with the larger volume of air that is traveling through the intercooler into the motor and how that all affects the uh, overall scheme of things and the efficiency of the entire build because there's so many videos out there now that will explain simply the benefits of a larger intercooler or the cons of too big of an intercooler. But what does that actually do for your turbo? How does that actually affect the air traveling into your motor? Yes, it cools it. Yes, a larger intercooler can slow, uh, slow down the turbo lag. I may not have perfect illustrations or examples to give to you, but I'm gonna do my best to get the point across in the way that I do on this channel for you guys. So if it seems like this video may not apply to your particular chassis, stick around because believe me, we're gonna apply it to any vehicle out there, whether it be Supra, 300ZX, BRZ, all of the above. Let's get into this. Now we're gonna get some driving in to really compare and contrast uh, how the larger intercooler and difference in intercooler piping has changed the overall drivability and actually sound of this car. Because believe it or not, by switching to all aluminum charge piping, um, it really woke up the turbo and it really changed the overall sound of the turbo in particular on this car. But before we really get into that, let's break down the absolute basics of the intercooler. And to do that, I'm gonna get a couple different intercoolers to show you guys the differences. Okay, so I have two intercoolers behind me, one out of my 300ZX. This is one of two intercoolers. The 300ZX uses dual side mount intercoolers to work with its twin turbo setup. Essentially, it uses a crossflow pattern intake manifold to feed turbos of opposing sides of the engine. And those opposing turbos each have their own intercooler and charge piping setup. And over here, this is our typical tube and fin setup. This is the one out of my 7M GTE from the factory. So if you look at the difference here, you can see, just see how much more restrictive this one here is in comparison to this one here, regardless of the overall size, because the air pretty much travels through these bars right here. This is where it gets the term bar and plate style. So air travels through these bars and obviously these fins is what traps the cooler air to cool the air traveling through these plates here. Over here, we have tube and fin, and essentially, it's a lot thinner. There are still fins that go between them. However, um, it's much more restrictive of a path going through, and to make up for the restrictive path, you pretty much need more overall volume of fins. Uh, it all comes down to the restrictiveness of the path and the volume of the overall intercooler. Typically, with more restriction, you need more volume. However, the biggest caveat to that is it's typically a much larger setup than it would be for this. Because there's about 40 years of difference, um, well, probably realistically 20 years of difference in technology between these two, this one is going to cool better and flow more regardless. This is definitely an early 80s design from a Toyota manufacturer, um, and this is an aftermarket design with obviously custom aluminum end tanks and the whole nine yards. For those of you Z32 guys, this is actually the CZP Titan intercooler. This little intercooler, little intercooler, while it may not seem like much here, um, is definitely really thick. And since there's two of them, it makes up for the size of the intercooler that is on my Super right now, because obviously this is probably a third of the overall length of it. However, it flows really well. I made 900 horsepower on two of these little intercoolers right here, and my IATs never got above like 140, at least on the dyno, rather. Another point here is that bigger isn't always better because, well, just because it's a bigger intercooler, that could seriously slow down the rate at which your turbo spools or the efficiency of your overall system. You gotta really weigh in how much air you're trying to flow through it, how much power you're trying to make, because obviously the more power you're trying to make, typically the bigger intercooler you want to cool that air. Too big of an intercooler on too small of a turbo could really hurt the overall efficiency of everything. However, upgrade the turbo and you have that bigger intercooler ready to go, 
you're not gonna have those problems. And it may not necessarily be an upgraded turbo. It may just be a turbo that just flows more air, substantially more air. For instance, the factory CT26 on this car will probably max out at around 300, 320 horsepower. Okay, so now there's one major point that I'm trying to get across here, and I'm gonna use a factory turbo setup as the perfect example here. And that is, if you go with too large of an intercooler, what happens to the efficiency of the turbo? Well, you can look at a turbo as pretty much a fan, and it's blowing through a funnel. And when you have a funnel, it's increasing the pressure at the other end of that funnel. Well, what happens when you enlarge the funnel? The pressure drops because it no longer has that same restriction that it's going through. It opens it up. So essentially, that's kind of what happens with a small turbo with a bigger intercooler and, well, this is not a good example, but a high flowing engine. Since the engine here is completely stock, it doesn't totally kill the efficiency of the turbo. However, with too large of an intercooler, that turbo is gonna have to work extra hard to fill the volume of the intercooler and flow essentially more air. However, you may notice a pressure drop in the overall system, but it'll make more power. Now you're probably wondering, well, Billy, that's kind of a pressure drop, isn't it? Yes and no. Hear me out, because the pressure drop at the intercooler is pretty much nothing because it's flowing so well. It's flowing so much better than a factory intercooler. Now that makes it easier on the motor, easier on all your internals. The overall system is flowing more efficiently. The only thing that it's putting more strain on at that point is the turbo. At that point, the bottleneck is the turbo and the head. So to get the motor to flow more air, we essentially would need to increase the cam lift and duration. We would have to open up the ports on the head. The engine, the valves, the camshafts are the ultimate restriction in your entire system. I'm gonna call it a system, the entire intake charge system. Um, the valves are the final piece. So from here, I am actually going to upgrade my turbo. I'm going to have to send it off, get it upgraded, see what it'll do. I realistically should put the car in a dyno at this point. Personally, dyno is just simply a tool. However, it would have been nice, I guess, to see a baseline perhaps with the car, um, to know what we started out with and where we're gonna end up. I'm gonna to say one thing here before you guys jump to the comments that know what I'm talking about because there's one major thing here, kind of a major flaw in what I said. Well, I just wanna clarify what I'm saying because ultimately, everything from the throttle body backwards, going throttle body to the exhaust wheel of the turbo, because nothing there changed, in this particular instance, um, the motor will make the same power as long as the tune, fueling, and ignition timing are all the same. It should make the same power at the same pressure. The biggest thing here is that the turbo will have to spend a little bit harder to make the same pressure in the system because it is overall flowing better. Once that engine starts spinning, this should actually shift our power band a little bit higher in the RPM, not too much but we will ultimately make more power higher in the RPM range. Internal combustion engines make power off of how much oxygen is going into the cylinder. So if we could get more oxygen into the cylinder by condensing the air with a cooler charge, it's pretty straightforward from there, right? It's going to make more power. The only problem is, again, like I've been saying, the turbo is going to spin more to make the same pressure because it's at that point denser, cooler air getting into the motor. Basically, less restriction requires more work to make the same pressure. While the intercooler on this car may not be extremely big compared to a lot of thousand horsepower cars, it is rather large for a simple 200, 250 horsepower turbo. Um, <laughs> it is a little bit overkill, I'm not gonna lie. And in all honesty, there's a certain sound that turbos make when they get past their efficiency range. And I'm pretty sure this one might be there at only about 14 PSI from what I've seen. Um, I did have the boost controller turned up, but let me tell you, it really wakes up around there. That is where this car and this motor is very happy at. 14 PSI, one bar of boost, 100 kilopascals, it's right on the money. So with that said, I hope that clarifies a bunch of things on the intercoolers. Let's go ahead and get to driving the car so we can compare and contrast uh, basically how it was before and how it is now. And of course, if you guys haven't already, be sure to head over to the website, billybuildswithad.com. Go get yourself some Mark III Supra merchandise. I know this is one of the few channels that actually works on th these kind of cars, as well as the Z32 stuff. Go ahead, hop on the website, get yourself some merch. I greatly appreciate it. 
and uh, give me a shout out. Alright, so the intercooler and piping kit is in the car. We got the car warmed up. We're gonna do a couple quick pulls. I want to test to make sure that there's no boost leaks and well the fueling is okay with it because that's pretty much the number one thing that's going to change when you upgrade your intercooler. It's going to flow a lot more air, it's going to be cooler air, so it's going to be a little bit denser meaning you're going to use a little bit more fuel since you're probably going to be making a little bit more power. I have tested this already and in all honesty I don't know if you remember in the last video where I said the blow up valve could be a pain in the butt. I was right. Blow off valve has actually blown off twice now. Um, for some reason, that stupid seat clamp is not seating in place. And I'm beginning to wonder if the new O rings that came in the kit are the wrong size. Actually, you know what? Let's do a quick pull right here. of a whistle honestly i'm not sure if that means that there's a boost leak but i might have to go back and hook up my boost leak tester and test that out because uh i don't remember it making that whistle before well the good news is the blow valve has not blown off this time i wish i would have gotten it on video because well no, I don't. It wasn't anything crazy exciting. It was actually a big letdown and kind of disappointing on my part. But you know what? It's running good now, and I'll take that for what it is. <laughs> Glorious sound of the 7M. It is so good. So there's two things we're on with the gauge cluster on this that I really want to fix. It's not necessarily that they're wrong, they're just, it's very poor. And that is the oil pressure gauge and the boost gauge. Boost gauge isn't that big of a deal, but I really want to upgrade the oil pressure gauge because that is very important on these motors and I'd really like to get accurate readouts from that especially because that, that just seems to be very sluggish in its response. And I don't know, maybe I'll come up with something here on my own here in a second. check out that boost leak we're running about 10 psi of boost right now so it should theoretically have a little bit more in it but i'm not totally sure the turbo is up to it i don't know guys i think i need to take you home and check it over maybe run some really good boost leak tests on it figure out where these leaks are coming from all right let's see what we got here I will forever say that. We got the front end lifting a little bit. I can start to feel that take off in first gear. The gearing in the car is actually quite long for being a five speed. Well, I guess five speeds are typically longer than a six speed, but compared to my daily being the Subaru BRZ, uh, the gearing is substantially longer in this car. But next up for the car, we got fuel system. So we got injectors here. They are literally in my Subaru. Um, and we got fuel pump. I got a Walbro 485. I'm gonna stuff into this thing. It's actually left over from my Z, but it should still work just fine. I fully expect to run into some sort of uh, restriction with the factory fuel lines on this. Um, after I get the 485 in, 
get that running right, and then probably once we get the fuel system running right, it is then time to upgrade the turbo and probably the exhaust manifold. I don't know how exactly I'm gonna go through with that, but we're definitely gonna work on all of that and see how it all comes out. I'm excited, I hope you guys are too. So stick around, if you aren't already, do me a favor and hit that subscribe button. Okay guys, we're gonna take the car back home. We're gonna double check all the hose clamps, make sure there aren't any boost leaks. I'll probably get out my boost leak tester, which I probably should have done before this drive. But we're gonna double check, make sure everything's tight. I really think the turbo is just uh, working a little too hard here. It's probably time to upgrade it. Definitely sounds like it's uh, overspinning, honestly. It could also just be the difference in piping because the aluminum piping definitely likes to change the tone of the air traveling through it, that is for sure. Just as I had expected, we're definitely starting to run out of fuel here um, before we even get to the top end. So what I did, and I actually did this off camera, I did this entire pull off camera, but I wanted to see what it would do at 65% duty cycle. I believe that's where I left it at. Okay, so if we look here, we're at, this is about 10 PSI. So 24 PSI atmospheric is about 10 PSI boost. And then going up from there for every four PSI is, well, another four PSI. So we hit about 29 and a half PSI through here. But then if you notice down here, look at the AFRs. We're losing AFR kind of rapidly as our RPMs begin to climb. And we're only at 3,800 RPM here. We're not even that high in the rev range. So what that tells me is that we are 100% losing fuel. We are running out of fuel here. The fuel system is maxed out, um, kind, of, kind of what I expected, but very, very early on. So this is the important stuff you gotta see after you do stuff like an intercooler upgrade, because if you don't see this, you could very easily detonate, hit knock, blow your motor, so on and so forth. If you look down here, we are actually starting to experience a little bit of detonation around here. Granted, that is also where I'm at full throttle. Then, you know, towards the top end, probably about right in here is where I let off the throttle and obviously AFRs go way lean. Yeah, we're only at nine degrees of timing. Knock level seems pretty consistent, so it's not too terribly much. I should probably do a few adjustments to that. And just for comparison's sake, if you look here, we have 5,200 RPM and about seven to eight PSI of boost. We are, AFRs are at 12.3, which, eight PSI of boost were to keep climbing, that's pretty much right where I would want it to be. We're not running crazy amounts of boost through the motor, so we don't need those 11.7, 11.5 AFRs that we would if we were making 20 plus PSI of boost. We're not even one bar over atmosphere, so it's not that big of a deal to be down in the 11.5 to 12.0 range of air fuel ratio. If you can sit here and throw more fuel at it in the fuel table, and then you go back to the log, and you see that it's still not picking up any richer AFR, then you definitely have your bottleneck of your fuel system, whether it be fuel injectors or fuel pump. So with that said, what do we do from here? Well, obviously we gotta worry about the fuel system. It needs an upgrade, it's still 100% stock. The batch fire fuel injection system on this 80s Toyota has got to go. We have got some fuel injector clinic injectors and I have a Walbro 485 fuel pump seen over here on the side waiting to go into the car. So we're gonna work with those two things and get this thing up to par, and uh, then she'll really wake up, and then at that point, we'll be maxing out the turbo. And you know what that means. From then on, it's go time. 